Hello, I'm Kyle Stallings. This is May 26, 2023. We're here in the Fellowship Hall at the Tomball Museum Center. And we're here today to meet with and interview our Tomball Mayor, Lori Klein Quinn. And this is part of our ongoing video interview series on some of the families that have made this great town of Tomball in Northwest Harris County such a wonderful place for all of us to live. Uh, you can see this video along with our other videos at our YouTube channel at Tomball Museum. Lori, thanks for joining us today. Oh. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, would you state your full name for us? Uh, Lori Klein Quinn. And where were you born? I was born in Tomball. I'm an original Tombalian. And which hospital or facility were you born in? Doc Graham on Carroll Street. The old that, hospital. The old on hospital, Street. Dr. Graham. I was born in the 19 area, and, um, and so yeah. <laughs> Doc Graham on Carroll Street uh, delivered all three of us. He was fairly new, yeah. and my dad, Howard Klein, was part of the a group of men at that time that helped to get him to Tombaugh to be, we needed a doctor here, we were growing, and remember mother said yes. Uh, he turned to me and he said, Jeanette, uh, she's Jeanette Kleb Klein, so married to Kleb. Uh, Jeanette, uh, we're gonna use this new doctor. And so all three of us were, he delivered all three of us. Wonderful. I remember Doc Graham, he was quite a character. He had a good personality, didn't he? He did. He was, uh, he really was a historian. He loved Tomball. He gave his life for Tomball. And he was really a historian. Whenever you, anything was going on, he would be there with eight millimeter films or the latest and greatest to film and video Tomball. And fortunately, a lot of that was was lost in different storms and such, but. Could you tell us, uh, who's your husband? My husband is David Quinn, and there is a David Quinn, uh, the Quinn family, a uh, Levy Quinn family, which is what Quinn Road is named for in Tombaugh, and there's even an intersection of Quinn and Klein, but he is not that family of Quinns. He's um, from Indiana. He's from Indiana. Uh, his they were farmers in Indiana, um, one of uh, five siblings, and so. But he's been in Texas though since he graduated from architectural school in Kansas State, moved to San Antonio, and then got an architectural job in in Houston. And so he's been here a long time, and we've been married thirty almost thirty three years now. Do y'all have kids? We have. Uh, four kids in our blended family. I have two instant daughters from his first marriage and then two daughters together. Great. So yes, and then from the, those four daughters, um, my two instant daughters have, one has two children, one has four, so we have six grandchildren. So uh, <laughs> how did you get involved in politics here in the city of Tomball? That was never on my to-do list, <laughs> was to get involved in in politics, but service, yes. Um, deep German family, deep German roots, and you serve. And so how you serve depends on the skills that the Lord gave you. And I graduated from college, uh, worked away from Tomball for about 10 years, but then in 29, came when I was 29, came back to Tomball and opened up a CPA financial planning firm. And that was the career that I went into and it, to serve people. And it was um, being a CPA and a financial planner, it was uh, very rewarding, not only to me, but to the families that I helped. So during that time, of course, jumped into the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I was Heart Association. My dad had some heart issues, so served in the Heart Association. The um, also got involved as a founding member of the Lone Star College Foundation, which is to raise money for scholarships so people can go to college even if they can't afford to go. So those were just ways to serve, and probably like you, we saw our parents serve. Your mother and my mother were brownie leaders together. That's what I heard, yeah. So, and we spent a lot of time in y'all's house out there 
up at the top room right above the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> so we had our meeting. So, but they taught us service, service to others, and that's what we were here for. So I was approached during that career to be on city council. My husband David was on city council, and he uh, was asked to run, and he did. And what his job, what he wanted to do, was get zoning in. Being an architect, he understood a lot of that, and he read all the zoning code, and he was very instrumental in getting zoning passed in this town. He stayed two terms, and after zoning was approved, he said, I'm done. No more. Two terms. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. But he was also involved in Rotary Club in Willowbrook, and so he comes from a service background, too, because that's what we're put on earth to do is serve. So when they asked me then, after he was off a while, he said, they asked me to run for city council. Um, I said, well, okay. Um, but fortunately, I did not draw an opponent. So I was on city council eight years and was going to resign the next year because I do believe that term limits are a good thing. It gives room for to bring the next generation of leadership. Uh, so... Um, then they asked me after I sold my business uh, two years ago, three years ago, um, I sold my business and uh, stayed a year for the transition and then was home, retired, and Monday was part of the weekend. <laughs> it was nice. And they approached me to run for, for a mayor. And so after a lot of prayer and searching, I said, okay, let's do this. So that's why I ran for mayor. Thank you. And very thankful to the citizens who voted me in. <laughs> so can you give us a description? We, we heard from uh, Wheeler Cove when he was mayor back in the early 1970s, so we'd kind of like to get uh, different versions from you of how it is today compared to what his was like. Can you describe how it is being mayor in Tomball today? Well, I think... Uh, we had talked earlier, Wheeler's salary was $50 a month, plus he got $10 per meeting. Uh, and I don't know how many meetings they had to have when he was mayor, but the, my salary is, and council salary, is $100 per meeting. And only city council meetings count. None of the workshops, none of the extras. So we make 200 a month. <laughs> so we make 200 a month, and the mayor makes the same thing as council. But I do have... I think it's, I have a stipend um, that to help pay for all my expenses, gasoline and going here and going there and doing things for the city. I want to say it's like $600 a month, Six, maybe 700 They take out taxes, so yeah. 600 I net, so that's 600 that's uh, 7200 plus... Um, 2400 so I make a little less than 10000 a year. So if you take inflation when, when Wheeler was, was mayor, yeah, it hasn't gone out much. <laughs> but that's okay. This is truly a, an act of love for the town. And he <laughs> described how the city back then was him and three ladies handling the business, and he had to personally write each check for the city. Mm -hmm. How is it today? We have 260 employees in the city. Back then, I think the population was under 2,000. Now it is 12,000. We have 12,000 people in our little less than 13 square miles of the city of Tomball. That is how big the city of Tomball is. Our ETJ is about 20 miles, and the school district is like 80 miles, 83 square miles. And the school district is all called Tomball. Because I have people ask about North Point. Well, that's not in the city limits, but that definitely is Tomball. And that's Tomball schools. And we, we claim them. We love them. Love our kids. But it's now 12,000 people in the city limits. And we expect to be 14,000 in 2025. We have the average age in Tomball, which used to be about... Uh, 56, 66, now is 36. We have more children and more families than we do people over the age of 65. Over the age of 65 is only 
So that changes a lot of the dynamics of the town. Um, as that happens, and we're thrilled for the growth, thrilled to bring families in. So I think it sounds like a large part of that is the great school system we have around here attracting mm -hmm. families to this area, is that right? That, and then Tomball, you, what we're trying to do is connect through um, sidewalks, and so we want to be a town that you can walk together and get places together and also a destination place. It's, we want it to have a small town feel, which the museum is a big part of that. Small town feel, remembering our history, with surrounded by big city conveniences. And we have Costco, be breaking ground later on this year. We have uh, 3.2 million of warehouse space coming in at the Grand Parkway. Um, Macy's has rented 900,000 of that in order to put in their online furniture and their distribution center. We have master uh, centers going on at the corners around the Grand Parkway, which has name stores and restaurants that everyone would recognize. So we're surrounded by big city amenities, but we're keeping our small town feel on our 115-year-old Main Street from Elm to Willow. So. It's, which is the main street that I rode my bike cycle up and down. It's a good history, and it's good that we're preserving parts of it, and mm -hmm. especially memories of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, give me an idea of, of your siblings. Mm -hmm. um, I have a brother and a sister. My brother lives in San Antonio. He's the baby of the family. He's five years younger than I am. And then I... He's, His name? Howard Klein Jr., and he is also a CPA. Um, my sister is an attorney and now a real estate broker in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She's about 18 months older than I am, Roxanne. Uh, the house that we lived in was on Roxanne Street. It was Roxanne and Hicks across from Zion Lutheran Church. Rox it was named Roxanne Street because she was the first child born on that street. We went to school at Zion Lutheran School, which was catty corner from Roxanne and Hicks. It was a four-room schoolhouse, two grades in each room, great education. And so they're both doing well. Roxanne is working in Santa Fe, New Mexico, married, and has one child who is also an attorney. And then Bo and I, he was called Bobo. When he was born, he was a junior, Howard Kahn Jr. So the discussion was, are we, what are we going to call him? And my father wanted Buckshot, and my mother said, no way. Are we calling him Buckshot? So we called him Bo, Bobo. So he was Bobo, and then he was Bo, and when he hit college, he started using Howard again. But he is a CPA and has a, a just sold a mandatory retirement in the practice that he built in San Antonio. And so he, my sister says, she used to kid her. She said, well, y'all had to become CPAs because neither one of you can spell. <laughs> and, you know, she's right. We, we don't write well. We don't spell well. And I said, that's okay because she can't balance her checkbook. Checks do not mean money. <laughs> so, but, uh, yes, we, we see each other. We just got together uh, a few weeks ago to celebrate her, a major birthday for her. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your mother. My mother was Jeanette Kleb. She was a Kleb. A longtime family in this area went to Tomball High School. Um, she had two siblings. Uh, Carolyn was a younger sibling, and Shirley was a sibling. Shirley Kleb, um, she, they've all passed away, and she had, uh, Shirley had two children, and Carolyn had two children, a cousins, and mother and daddy had three children and married to Monty Kleb. My grandmother was, uh, she worked here in Tomball, um, and so did my grandfather, and he was part of the school district. He was part of the school district back then. Um, I think he had, Wheeler was, no, uh, Mr. Bonham, I think, was mayor back then long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so it was Monty Kleb and was part of the Kleb family in this community. And his cousins have settled in Klein and Spring area as my cousins settled in Klein and 
There's schools named after them, but that's where. Their children married uh, Shearers and Tomex, Delho Marines, and um, CB, and one brother, CB Tomek. And they were all in this area, too. Oh. I've heard mm -hmm. some of those names before. Mm -hmm. um, so your mother, unfortunately, passed away quite young. and Your dad remarried? Yes. Um, my mother passed away very suddenly um, when I was a freshman in college, uh, just shy of my 19th birthday, and which was a big shock to, to all of us. Now, looking back at at uh, the hist what they've learned about blood clots and stuff, it could have been saved with a baby aspirin. <laughs> but back then, um, medicine had not advanced as it is now. And so a few years later, Daddy married uh, Patricia Nicklo Pace. Patricia Nicklo, her father was George Nicklo, who was the head of the Humble Camp, head of the Humble Camp here in Tombaugh. And in 19, was it 35, 37, we were Oil Town, USA. I got, in our museum, we have that wonderful humble camp and all the replica that people need to come see. And so he was in charge of all of that. And so his daughter and my father and mother were high school. They went to school together, junior high. Pat went to a boarding school the last couple years of high school though and so she wasn't here in Tomball and ending up living in Tyler and she was, was single uh, after my mother died and so George Nicolo set up a dinner put the two of them together and and rest is history they got married they were married 10 years before my dad died and they she prolonged his life I'm very grateful to have uh, the Nicolo family is part of our history. Mm -hmm. And I heard that they bought and remodeled a, a historic home in this area. Can yes. you tell us about that? Brill Miller House. Um, in the late 1800s, when the original families came over, uh, the Brills and the Mullers were part of that. How do you spell Mueller for us? It's M-U-E-L-L-E-R, but I always pronounced it Miller. Miller. I've heard that a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, the Miller family is still here, all around, and still doing a lot for the community. Mm -hmm. So, the they decided to, well, we had 25 acres at the end of Cherry Street, which is now where there is a, a home, um, apartment complex in there, and, and it's been broken up into different parcels. But the original house that we moved from Roxanne Street to Cherry Street when I was in high school. And so they then took seven acres of the 25, sold everything else, and brought in, moved the Brill Miller House, an old historical house, which was out toward... I think it wasn't far, I don't think, but I think it was over off of uh, Holdreth and another road down where, further down there. They actually have pictures of it coming down the road to put on the seven acres. And then Pat started restoring it in order to meet the 100 year historical marker and become a certified historical home, the Brill Miller House. They had to. Back then, the work had to be done authentically in the period from the house, and it was a lovely home. I think she hosted several things there for the Historical Society or the Tomball Garden Club or Study Club is what it was called back then. Yeah. Tomball Study Club. And the so it sounds like it was built sometime <laughs> in the 1800s? Mm -hmm. wow. It was built in the 1800s. It was over 100 years old. Is that house still there today? The house is still there. The people who bought it, though, did not keep it um, as a certified historical structure. When you do have a certified historical structure, if you break a window, you've got to go find the pane from the 1800s and have it shipped in. Wow. So everything has to be done to period to keep that historical. And for many years, even after her death, it was. But I think the current owners have enlarged it and changed it a little bit. Uh, so Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's back up a little bit to uh, your school time. Um, 
describe what, what schools did you go to here in the Tomball area? Zion Lutheran School, which is no longer exists, but it was right next to Zion Church on Hicks Street, Roxanne, and all four of all three of us went there. Uh, we could sit in our kitchen and hear the bell ring, and you can make it down the road, cross the sewage dip, ditch, and slide into slide into the your seat before the bell finished. Uh, we had two grades, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Great school, wonderful education. We were the largest graduating class at that time, my class was, that we had seven people. <laughs> the class before us had three people. We still see the people today and their families. But in eighth grade, um, there were five girls and two guys, and they were all doll families in this area that are still here. And so the teachers had to challenge us, and they would put all your assignments on the board, and if you were through by noon, they had to have something else to do with us. So our eighth grade project was, okay, gang, build a library. We need a library in this school. Seven of you figure it out. Uh, here's your parameters. You have no money and no place to put it. Good luck. <laughs> and so we actually, through that collaboration with each other, and then going out and making contacts in the community, we built the library that was here. We got the books, we found a closet, we redid things, we, we did a library. Um, and so that skill, looking back, has taught me so much to be able to collaborate and communicate, have a common goal and get it done. So who were the teachers that you remember from that school? Oh, let's see. Mr. Flotz was the one that really comes to memory. Uh, Mr. Flotz, uh, it was probably stricter in schools than it is now. Uh, every now and then, you know, there would be guys that, that um, would act up and there would be a flying eraser that would hit them in the back. <laughs> so if they went out to playground and you had eraser dust all over your clothes, you had messed up in class. So <laughs> Mr. Flotz. Pretty direct. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty direct. <laughs> but um, Mr. Obermiller, who uh, was a gifted musician too, so he taught us a lot about music, music and he was the organist at Zion Church for many years. Um, and so those are the two that really come to mind. My grandmother did the cooking in the kitchen on Zion, and she was part of the ladies' group that did that. And what so was her name? Alma Kleb. Al McCleb, and so she, uh, Miss uh, Jonathan Williams' mother, and Lou Gos Goswood, and Agnes Williams, and there was a whole group of families that children were in school, and so the the grandparents and the parents they would feed us. There was not a state program for food. She also worked at the high school, Tomball High School on Main Street, and you had to have two sittings because you had to feed the kids and then everyone in town showed up to eat because the food was delicious, delicious. Everybody would show up to eat there. Mm -hmm. And so you had to have two times in a different place for the public and the school kids. Because back then, Tomball High School, when we graduated, four grades were at Tomball High School on Intermeet, uh, there on Main Street, and we were the first grade to graduate 100 people. And so now there's... A thousand kids there in fifth and sixth grade mm -hmm. that make up that school, so it, it's amazing. But it was it was a, a lot of fun. That also gave us a deep biblical because everything was biblical based. And um, Pastor Metz was the minister who taught us two years of confirmation. It's associated with Missouri Synod Lutheran, and he said, "Here's your Bible." Here's your colored pencil and our ink. And you have, we're going to read the entire Bible and underline it in the words of Jesus, the law, and the gospel. And for two years, that's what we did, and he trained us in. And I, yeah, I mean, people say, how did you learn all this? I said, that was the education. It was a great education. Uh, the school did close. Joined with Salem, and Salem now is running the longest-running public school. I mean, the non-public school, Lutheran school, is About Salem Lutheran. How long ago did they join together? 
Yeah. Oh, I was an adult. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was an adult. I think Zion just finally closed its doors even to preschool within the last five years. Oh. So where did you go after eighth grade? Eighth grade, we went to Tomball High School. Which <laughs> building? Uh, on Main Street. Mm -hmm. and by Where the, the intermediate is now. Mm -hmm. And that, that was after the high school burned, so you got the second building? Got the second building. Okay. Mm -hmm. The high school had burned right before we went there. Mm -hmm. Right, the gymnasium part, not part of it. But those halls are still the same. I was just in there last week talking to the kids on career day and walked in and it was deja vu. It's still the low halls on with lockers everywhere, and this is how you get to the band hall, but then they have a huge, beautiful library where the football field was. <laughs> so, mm. But it was nice to be there. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so you went four years there? Four years there. And then I um, went to, well, I had grandiose plans about college. I decided I was going to do college at sea. And I remember going to my parents and saying, um, Mother and Daddy, I've researched, I've found a floating school at sea where I would spend one semester on the ocean and travel around to different countries. And they thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, and when you wanted to talk with Mother and Daddy about something, you always did it uh, after dinner, after the dishes were done, after the table was cleared. <laughs> after homework, and you'd sit down with them and say, okay, this is what I'd like to do at college. My sister went to Rice. She went to Rice. So they probably thought I was going to do something like that, but no. And so they said, well, that's a great idea. We wish you luck. When would you leave? He said, well, here's the application. I said, oh, no, no, we're not paying for this. <laughs> so I went, Okay, plan B. <laughs> so, selling Christmas cards wasn't going to do it. <laughs> so, so, I ended up graduating from University of Houston at Clear Lake with my accounting degree. And still close to the water, but University of Houston at Clear Lake with my accounting degree. And then later I got my master's degree at uh, University of Colorado with an emphasis financial planning, estate planning, retirement planning. How did and you get interested in the water? And University at sea. We, we went to the beach every year. Um, we rented a beach house for two weeks in Surfside, Texas, as long as I can remember. Plus, we would go. Mother loved to fish, and I was her fishing buddy. So uh, we were always at the beach. Uh, we went to Padre Island, just any body of water close by. And then it became a tradition in the Lutheran Church in Zion where one week was family, and the next week it was youth groups. So mother and daddy were very involved in the youth group and everything that we did growing up. Mother was there, she sewed twirling outfits, she uh, took us shopping, she was very, you know, as a family, they were involved in everything we did. Well, and let's so. go back to high school where I found some pictures from your old, uh, the, some of the, books put out. Oh, I'm my so heavens. <laughs> just wonder if you could hold that up for the camera and point <clears throat> where you are on there. Okay, let's see. That was student council. Let's see, there's Barbara, Nancy, there's Suzanne, Nanette, Brenda. Let's see. Oh, I think that's, yeah, right there. No, that's Nanette. That's, yeah. I'm right, right there. Yeah, point it that way. That's me. Thanks. So you got involved in student government way back there, didn't way you? Way back. Uh, student council, of course, this is Barbara Bradfield. Still <laughs> so, a good friend, huh? Still a good friend. And uh, a lot of these, there were seven of us that came over from the Lutheran school. And when we graduated, we were one, two, three, four, and six. And so half, over half of us were in the top ten graduating class. And top three were three of the Lutheran, called the Lutheran school kids. Um, that was um, Sharon Doyle Menegaz, Connie Fairley Barnett, and then myself. I got to say the prayer. I didn't have to do a speech. So that was good. <laughs> and then Debbie Weinberg Garrett, and the Weinberg family down here. But I look at all these kids and, yeah, 
good they time were, back then, huh? They were, were all still here. Yeah. And this was from your band days, right? Yes. Um, I was, we didn't have a band. I'm right there. That's me, right there. Tell us about your band experience. Well, we didn't have a band at, uh, growing up at the Zion. We didn't have, we had singing, but we didn't have any instruments. So, Mary Neely. Um, I go to the Tomball football games and I would look at the twirlers and I said, that's what I think I want to do. And that was good because I could play piano, but I couldn't play any instrument. So I asked Mary Neely to teach me how to twirl. And so she and Rita Stutz of the Stutz family in the area, <laughs> they had a little twirling. They would after school, they would, any girls who want to learn, they would teach them the fundamentals of twirl. So I tried out for the twirling line going into my freshman year and was selected and then went from there to head twirler to drum major for the last two years uh, that I was in high school. And during concert season, I played the, we got a marimba, a glockenspiel, and then the big bass drum, I would play that when the person wouldn't show up because <laughs> hmm. I could keep a beat. <laughs> that's, that's what I played. But Who was the band um, director back Leonard then? Leonard Chambers. <laughs> Leonard Chambers is the one who does the, he started the block T formation that we still do today, grandioso that we still do today, and also we still do the horse, play the horse. Uh, so I went to the high school when I first got elected. I was supposed to spray them down with the fire hose from the fire truck because they were practicing outside and it was so hot. So that was kind of the pattern. We spray them down once a year while they were practicing before football season and it rained that day. So we all ended up in the band hall at the last minute and talking with them about, they were asking me about how it was in band and how we did things. And so I said, well, I said, what's your favorite song? I said, I said oh, grandioso. Grandioso? They all jump up and grab their instruments and play grandioso and, and still do the block T when they walk off. And we were an award-winning band and twirling line back then. So then they said, well, what's, they said, what's the next one? I said, well, it's an old one. Y'all probably don't know that one anymore. It's called The Horse. The Horse. <laughs> still playing that. And uh, that's nice to see. You kept up <laughs> some see. of the history. Yeah. Yes. And we have a wonderful... Tomba High School band, their flag core this year, um, which is kind of, I didn't know what a flag core was except in the last few year, 10 years, I guess, and they just won state. They are going to be, uh, they won the highest score of 22 divisions in the state of Texas. We honored them at city council. Um, so they're if you haven't seen their return, I'm sure it's on YouTube or somewhere. It's unbelievable. They twirl huge flags. Hmm. And then something that looks like a, a, it's not a baton, it's bigger than a baton. And so it's amazing when you have all 13, 15 doing exactly the same at the exact same time. Hmm. Y'all probably paid football or something. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just so I was wondering if goes. I remember... Leonard Chambers was the band director for so many years, and mm -hmm. so many kids were touched by his life. But uh, mm -hmm. do you have any favorite memories of working with Mr. Chambers? Um, he was very good at uh, letting you lead. He would give us, just like in um, growing up in junior high and elementary school, here is the goal, here are the tools, good luck, <laughs> go forth and do. And so any ideas that I brought to him, he established an order and a leadership and an authority in the band, which you need when you have, he had 100 students, I think, back then, to keep order. And so he would rely on his, who, his leadership team. And being drum major, that included me and all his heads of all the different instruments. So I learned so much from him. That when he would say, give me your best ideas for this. Um, see you tomorrow at 2. So go home, you read, you study, you didn't have internet, you had things called encyclopedias. <laughs> and so you 
<laughs> you had to look up the books and come up with and ask uh, your, your classmates and then make the report and sit down with them. We'd like to do this, 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 and this. He said, I think this would be good. This may be a problem. Have you thought about that? But just that skill of learning how to interact with people, how to get things done, how to run a business, because it was a business, how to help with controversy. Um, just because there's a lot of people that we don't all agree on everything, which that's a good thing. Can you imagine how boring the word would be if we always agreed on everything? So, because that diversity builds strength, and he helped us to, and these were high school kids, so there is a lot of drama in high school. <laughs> but there was not a lot of drama in band. Okay. And so he helped to uh, teach us how to do that, which is skills that touched everybody that came through band. I don't know a single person in band that didn't have a good feeling of being uh, led by Mr. Chambers. It was a good experience. It was. Another photograph I found is here. If you could hold that one up for the camera. <laughs> well, this uh, made my sister proved what she had to say. That's me. I won the math award <laughs> so, in junior high. So that is me, and I, uh, I won the math award. That's wonderful. Uh, you're not going to see me in the creative writing or any of the spelling. <laughs> but I guess that's why you went into being the CPA. <laughs> I went to CPA. Uh, we had Mr. and Miss Jones. Miss Jones was an English teacher. Mr. Jones was a math teacher and great teachers. And there was a group of us who did pretty well in math. And so our senior year, one semester, he said, OK, we're going to do something different. We're going to create a math. And we're going, you can create a math? He said, yeah. You know, math is just rules and postulates and theorems and uh, symbols. And that symbol means to do this. Somebody sat down and said, when you see a plus sign, it means add these two numbers. When you see a minus sign, you mean subtract. Well, you can create any type of math you want. And so let's dig in and create and name our own math system. And so after talking to us, and there were about 20 kids in the class, we created Pruitt. That was the name of our math system. Hmm. We created Pruitt. And we came up with what the symbols did and what you do. And um, we named it after David Pruitt because um, he was the only football player in advanced math. <laughs> so, <laughs> David Pruitt. It was called Pruitt. And that taught us so much, all of us, about thinking about things outside the book. You know, thinking how can you solve it? How, be creative. And there is no right or wrong as long as you follow the rules. So it was good. It sounded like a great experience. It was. It was. So let's also talk about your dad, Howard Klein. He was a long-term Tomball attorney, but mm -hmm. I guess he was born and raised here, right? Uh, he was actually born. I have um, pictures of the house. Sure. Because uh, he was Carry one of here. nine children. My grandfather, A.B. Klein Sr., was one of seven from the Klein family, and they were in Spring, Texas. They were actually the old Winchie Saloon, the Winchie Saloon, or Winchie... It's not a saloon anymore. It's a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, that area was where they were. And this house was where he was born. This house is still standing in Old Town Spring today. It is full of retail shops right now, but it still is the same house that my father was born in. Teddy was born there. Uh, Rosalie was born there. Margie was born there. Daddy was born there. So I think four of the nine, may have been five of the nine, but four of the nine were born in that house. And so it still exists today in spring. He, my grandfather was one of seven that came from, um, well, that came over, the Klein family came over in the late 1800s from Germany and settled in the, came in through Galveston, settled in the spring Klein area. Uh, he was one of seven, and his brother George and himself decided to leave the family businesses, which was farming and grocery stores, 
and move to Tombaugh and start the businesses in Tombaugh. So that was in the, we had oil had been discovered, I want to say, it's on the feed store, 1920, there's a date on the feed store, 1923, it was in the early 1900s, and they came over and had a, right at that location, team has the building now, the family gave the team to the building to team um, before my grandmother passed away. And so that was her wishes. So we gave that building to team and team is still there today. That corner office was Doc Graham's office. It was also Guarantee Bond State Bank, <laughs> that corner office where the, they give out the food now. And so then, that's, that's where it has the, the blocks that have the kind of opaque glass. Mm -hmm. It sort of looks like a pharmacy building, but... It was actually a doctor's office. Ah. It was Doc Graham's office. I see. Yeah, and then now it's the food pantry. Mm -hmm. But there was also Garandy Bond State Bank, too, was there. Lowell Cox family started right there. And then they moved across the street or at the school district, what used to be Tombow Independent School District, and then they built the big building over there where Bank America is, the Cox family. And it was Garandy Bond State Bank. But that was the center of town. That was and the grocery store. Your family store. had the grocery store right there in the same, connected right. to that building. Right? Yes, that was, and my father had, he was 311 Commerce Street was his law office. So that whole block was kind of a Klein Corner. The feed store was there, and that's where people that came in for feed. Uh, we had cattle, we had, um, there was not a cemetery or any, I mean, a funeral home there. So you could go in there at one time into the grocery store and the feed store and get everything you need. You could buy a casket or a loaf of bread. Hmm. <laughs> one stop shopping. One stop shopping. They admitted it. Yeah. I, guess. I think these are pictures of the entire, uh, has my grandmother and my grandfather. My grandfather died in 1956. That was Alex B. Klein? Alex B. Klein. And his wife's name was? Uh, Rosa Howdy Klein. She was a Howdy. She was one of 11. H-A-U-D-E? H-A-U-D-E, Howdy Elementary. That was all her family. And where was their family from, the Howdies? Um, Germany. Yeah. These were all German. These were all German families that came over. And who were their kids? Could you name them for us? Uh, yes, there's my, the oldest was my Uncle Teddy. Um, he, he is, and he, well, he has passed away now. Most have passed away. There's only half left. But my Uncle Teddy, then uh, ha Aunt Margie, um, then Howard Klein. My dad was number three. Then it was Rosalie, and then Shirley. Robert, I'm trying to do it in an order. Robert, um, A.B., Ida, Milo. Yeah. Great, I didn't know the order. And so that was, that's the order. Mm -hmm. um, after my grandfather died, by then in 56, he had opened up the funeral home. He had opened up the, of course, he had the grocery store, the feed store. Um, it was all still located right there, but the feed store was kind of located across the street from where City Hall is right now. That, the building's gone, but that was the funeral home. That's where the funeral home. You got married and you lived above the funeral home. <laughs> Teddy and Leora lived above the funeral home. Uh, I think Mother and Daddy did for a little while, too. Uh, that's where you lived after you got married because you always worked in the family businesses, but Daddy became the attorney. And so in the family. And so when my papa passed away in 56, um, then daddy, uh, there was a trust. And so my father and two siblings, um, which were the three oldest, kind of took over running the trust for my grandmother's benefit, 100%, and then the family letter. He did estate planning. So that's how it was easy to pass things on. But we all worked. When you were 13, you worked. You, you went to work. And we had feed stores, we had the funeral homes, we had the law offices, we had the grocery stores. But there was a strong German work ethic in all of them and a, 
a sense of serving and fairness that we grew up with. So the girls became, my aunt Shirley was a teacher, Margie was a, retired with the VA as a nurse, um, Ida was also taught, um, let's see, yeah, Shirley, Ida, Margie, yeah. Oh, that's it. There were more guys than girls. So, um, Rosalie. Rosalie was also a teacher. So, and then the guys worked in the businesses, which were mainly the oldest, the Teddy Klein family, the Robert Klein family, and Daddy. And then my AB is a doctor. Milo is a CPA, retired with, had financial with uh, Houston Barge and Towing. He, and Slumberjay, he's a CPA. So they all went into different prof professions, but the family supported all that. It was my grandfather's desire that every child is educated in whatever profession they want to be in. And so the three oldest made sure that happened. And my dad was kind of the, uh, helped to run the trust. And they there. So they, um, Unfortunately, we had grand family reunions. Uh, we'd have the Rosa Bowl games every day on my grandmother's birthday until she passed away, which was in her early, which is her 90s. What were those? <laughs> she worked in the supermarket. She worked just like mm. everyone else did. Let's go back one generation. So, um, A.B. Klein Sr.'s dad, what was his name? Um, A.B. Klein's... Let's see. I think I've got that one. Hey, John and Ida? Yes. John and Ida and Fred. He um, married. Actually, I brought one of the old books from um, John A. Klein uh, that he wrote in 69. And he was, he grew up in the Spring Klein area, but he ended up establishing and running the School for the Deaf uh, up, up north and retired from there. So, and his. Jacob Zahn family came over. That may be a generation before, though. Adam and Frederica Klein Klink. Uh, Adam, Frederica, uh, well, Klink Klein. Frederica was a Klink. His wife was a Klink. Klink family. And they came over. I understood uh, they were the first generation actually to come here from Germany. Is that right? Right. They were the first one. It was the Adam Klein Sr. So hold up that so, book for the camera because I. It's a I, very I old book. To pull that off and, well, very so. old. But he wrote it in '69 before he died. Yeah, <laughs> and we also had found this other book that mm -hmm. was very interesting. Mm -hmm. This uh, was written by the Klein Diana Historical, Sellers. yeah, Sellers. Um, Klein Bank, mm -hmm. which John Klein actually, Alvin and Roberta Klein started Klein Bank, and John Klein. Uh, was the main owner of the bank. They had four children, and John ran the bank, but their other children were involved too. And so they had a Klein Historical Foundation, and Diane ran it, and there is a wonderful farm uh, that the Klein Historical Foundation supports. Wonderful of, farm? Um, yes. That's a yeah. nice museum over there. Very nice. Klein. And so he sanctioned that book to be done. Go well, back. It was interesting reading. So that A. B. Klein Sr. and George, his brother George Klein said, we're going to Tombaugh. Right. Um, parents had died, so it was run by the you know, oldest and such, and seven siblings running a business together. With um, They've decided to leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know exactly why. Yeah. They decided to leave and come to Tombaugh. And so they established the same thing, feed store, supermarket, Whatever the need was, that is what they came up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, do you know the language? I guess when they came over, they spoke German as a native language, right? Right, and there's an interesting story. When we were cleaning out some of the um, boxes and such that I had uh, stored, and my dad had stored, we were going through that, and we found a letter, because German was spoken in the home for a long time. But then World War II came. And my, apparently, because 
unfortunately, a lot had passed away. <laughs> My grandmother wasn't alive anymore to ask, how much German did you speak in the home? But she knew German. And so, Rosa. and her siblings, yes, Rosa and the Howdies knew German. Yeah. So there was still German spoken in the home. Well, in World War II, they stopped all that, of course. They mm -hmm. stopped it long before that. Mm -hmm. But we, this area, and my Aunt Shirley recently, in the last, I'd say, 10 years, she did a lot of research on the German internment camps that were in the Huntsville area. This was the homes of the German internment camps around Huntsville, where the Japanese internment camps were more in California. And after, when World War II started, there was big suspicion to German communities. And there is a letter that we found that my grandfather had written uh, to the military association showing I am a patriot. I, I love this country and giving the history. I have a son in the Navy. And it was all of the other neighbors who also had chimed in to say, this man is a patriot. I know they, they know German, but no, they are a patriot. They are American as you can get. And I thought, Oh, how interesting that in, when Shirley did research on this, my Aunt Shirley, she lives in Georgetown now, but my Aunt Shirley uh, Klein Harrington, uh, her husband was Hap Harrington, who was a longtime mayor of Tomball and school district superintendent <laughs> of Klein. So she, uh, she was a teacher, and so she had found all of the camps and the research, what was going on about uh, the Germans from all over coming here to be put in internment camps. But they actually, a lot of them, some of them are German prisoners mm. that were put into these internment camps. And they were treated so well by this community and that a lot of them went back after the war because they had to and came back and settled in this area. Mm. So that history exists in this area because of the kindness and the upbringing of the German settlers that were here. And that letter that my grandfather had to write, apparently somebody had questioned his loyalty. <laughs> and it was the community. And I'm wondering how close were we really? Yeah. Was my father, because my father was alive then, uh, to be put into an internment camp. So, and yes, family, I'm going to make you copies of that letter if you're watching this video. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, beautiful history. It's, we just found it. It's yeah. interesting that the, the tensions that must have been going on during World War II, both in Japanese families and German, mm -hmm. right. German Texan families, right? Yeah. So let's go back to Adam Klein. I, I understand he was Johann Adam, but I'd heard most of the people talk to, about him as Adam. Mm -hmm. Did he go by Adam, do you know? Um, as far as I know, All right. Uncle Adam, Uncle Adam, Uncle Johnny, Uncle, well, that's So right. this was the one who first came over in 1852 from Germany, mm -hmm. and this book by Dr. Seventh showed that he came uh, to New Orleans and then St. Louis and ended up in Herman, Missouri for a little while, mm -hmm. where his, um, I guess his wife's half-brother, Matthias Klink, was living. Right. And they lived there for a while. But then he went out to California in the, the gold rush, right? That's right. Tell he, us about that. Well, he came over. Um, they ended up coming in through Galveston, oh, New Orleans, and then some, um, yeah, it came in through New Orleans, and then they got to, I guess, sail the coast to Galveston area. But he and a couple friends of his, I guess they met on the ship, they because there's uh, two different stories. One, his wife went with him. One, his wife did not go with him. And I kind of think that he took his wife for safety. That was not a safe thing to do, was to go to the gold rush. The gold rush was 19, 1849. And so he and his another friend went to California, left his I think he left his wife there with her cousin. And so they discovered gold. They were very successful in discovering gold. Well, they had the gold on them, so they started back. And what happened was that they were mugged and the gold was stolen, as that happened sometimes. So the gold was stolen. 
but being a good, good, good German, he had a money belt that never left his body. So the gold was in the saddlebags. The saddlebags were stolen, but he had his in a money belt that he slept with and never took off. Mm. So yes, they did lose a lot of the fortune, but they had enough to come and get his wife, come down to Texas and buy the land that they were giving away back then. You know, you could buy, what was it, 840 acres? Something like that from the government. They had enough to buy land. A league of land. Was league of like land. Forty-three hundred acres. Right, and that is Old Town Spring area uh, and all that area. Mm -hmm. And he had enough to start the farming and move to that area. So I guess they mm -hmm. first. It sounded like they first moved around that area and Klein on along what is now Spring Cypress Road. Is mm -hmm. that roughly where they came right. to? Right. This is my mother. This is my mother and dad. Um, that's their engagement photo. Uh, that's what they looked like right after, right after high school, before mm -hmm. college. This is my mother with the three of us, Roxanne, Bo, and myself. This is my dad with my sister and I. See there, and then let's see. Oh, and this is my grandmother. Uh, I think it. This was. Christmas celebration of the, my parents' 25th wedding anniversary was in June, and then she died suddenly in November. But they had a big event at the house that was out at the end of Cherry Street. Mm -hmm. So, But this is the club side. This was hanging in my grandmother's room. She unfortunately began to have some dementia issues and lived in a in the, the nursing home, which is called Winslow. It was a, um, you know, back then they didn't have assisted living. It was called nursing home. So this hung in her room just so she could go through and she would recite people's names as long as she could. But it was a wonderful place to grow up. I feel very fortunate that um, to grow up here. This is why we moved here, moved back. When my husband and I married, we, I lived in the Champions area, and so they moved into um, Stephanie, um, my instant daughter. She's my daughter, though. She, I love all my daughters. Very fortunate <laughs> for instant, for daughters. But she moved in, and David, and then a few years later, David said, uh, you need to be, you need to have a child. I said, honey. I didn't marry till 35, and I'm going, I'm not sure I can have a child. He said, well, if it's possible, you ought to have a child. And I said, well, OK, you know, we're at an age that people take things a little more comfortable than raising a baby. And he said, no. Nope. I, I said, you know that red Corvette you always wanted? You will never see it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I don't care. <laughs> So the Lord blessed us with two healthy babies um, that I had later in life. And then um, when we were living in Champions, and he said, child needs to grow up with a, in an area instead of, hi, I'm from the unincorporated area of 1960. That is not a town. Let's move home. So my grandmother had passed away. And when people, when my family heard that we were going to move back to Tomball. They said, please buy your grandmother's house. And we did. And we had the privilege of living on Barbara Street. I loved it. I could stand in the living room, see all three, three bedrooms. Uh, couldn't watch television. Everybody had to go to bed at the same time because <laughs> keep everybody awake. Big backyard, great birthday parties. It was great. Yeah. It was really great. And then uh, as they got older and more and more things going on, we ended up buying a home in Hunterwood. We kept that house for a long time, but the people who bought it love it as much as I did. Wonderful. I, I, every now and then I'm going, OK, are you keeping my house for me? Because I'm <laughs> <laughs> Old time family house, right? But I, I'm very privileged to be uh, married to a man with such foresight, too. Great place to raise a family. So could you give a, a description of what Tomball felt like when you were growing up as a kid? compared to Tomball today? Oh, well, everybody knew everybody. 
you were related to over half of them and you knew the other half too. So you had more um, freedoms. Just like I said, I'd get on the bicycle, we'd, you'd go everywhere. Um, but you had rules too, that you had to be home by dark, you had to be home by dinner. Um, you had chores, you, you did your work and you did it to the best of your ability. But when you're through, yes, then you were, could go play. I'd meet girlfriends over at the school over at Zion and we'd do flips on the swings. We still laugh about that now because I still see them. And we, we keep saying we're going to see which of us can do a cartwheel, but we haven't been brave enough to try that yet. Because <laughs> so, uh, we still get together. We call ourselves the Trinity Girls. I mean, the Zion Girls, we get together. Uh, Zion, because uh, we graduated from there, and we get together for dinner every now and then, the four of us that still live here. And then Trinity Lutheran is where the girls went to school because they had started in Zion, and then they ended up in Concordia going to high school at Concordia. Our children did because it was important to have the church school combination for us. And education had changed stuff, had changed so much since then that you couldn't have that in public school. We wanted to go to how we were raised, which you got in trouble at school, you got in trouble at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there were boundaries. There were things that you had to accomplish and you, you were taught to do that. There was no free ride there. So we wanted a church school combination, so we ended up at Trinity and then they went to Concordia. And that has changed so much, the education system in our schools. But of course, we have so many more people. Every policeman knew everybody. You knew the firemen, it was volunteer back then. At 10 o'clock, you better be home. I think during the week it was nine and 10 on weekends. The big thing to do was to drag Maine and yell at everybody as they were going by and say hello and then meet at the goalpost and play pinball and but nine, ten o'clock at night, that was it. You were, you went home. <clears throat> you went home. <laughs> so I still have a fond memory of the Gulf Post hamburgers because I love their, they had a mustard hamburger that was just yes. really good. But to you working there, maybe you don't have as fond a memory. Oh, I do. do. I, I, it turned out to be a great thing because yeah. everybody came in. Sure. And so you saw all your classmates. Yeah. You saw all your classmates and the Barnett's on that. Uh, they had also a little a diner there that sometimes I did waitressing at that too. I never was good at the dip tops though. And um, Miss Barnett said, uh, Lori, yes, if you drop the ice cream into the dip top, you are going to clean that again. <laughs> <laughs> that was the ice cream combs. This was before Dairy Queen. The ice cream combs and you, you had to dip it real fast in the chocolate before mm -hmm. it would go, the dip top. and. And then um, pinball tournaments. Uh, I served a, a lot of the hamburgers, the mustard hamburgers and hot dogs. Yeah. <coughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, getting out of school, they had the lunches there, but seniors could go. So we would race to Goodson's. We would race to Goodson's and Mog Goodson's, and this was when it was over in Huffsmith. Mog Goodson's, and you would have She'd cook X amount of hamburgers, and you could grab a hamburger, eat it real fast, and get back to the school in time. Church, uh, we got mad at the Methodists. I think I remember Mother and Daddy saying the Methodists are letting them out 15 minutes early, which means they got to Peck Hotel to eat all the food before, <laughs> to get the food before the rest of it. <laughs> and so it was a community connected like that. Mm -hmm. And... You don't see as much of that, unfortunately, with so many people, and which is a good thing. I mean, life goes on. Um, more and more people are coming in wanting that life for their kids and their children, a sense of community, a sense of togetherness, a sense of a common belief and goal. And, there's, and so it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And I think diversity makes us stronger. So we have wonderful families from all over. Uh, there's quite a bit of diversity in Tombaugh, and I think that is progress. I think that's progress. 
because the world is diversified. And we're all immigrants. Back then, we were just all German immigrants. <laughs> it was a great place to live back then, but even today, it's still, mm -hmm. it's still a pretty nice place to live, right? Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tombaugh's a great town. A great town. And we still have the historical basis. It's kind of fun having some of the historical buildings still here and mm -hmm. all the festivals that you, with the mm -hmm. both the chamber and the city, help put together. Mm -hmm. How did that come to be with the festival area that on Market Street and all that. Do the you, depot? You know? yeah. Well, you know the, you know how we got our name, Tom Ball, was we used to be called Peck, Texas. And in 1907, we changed it to Tom Ball after Thomas H. Ball, the father of the Port of Houston. Uh, he was the one who got the Port of Houston going, and he said, we need a railroad stop. Let's put it in Tom Ball. So that's how our depot came about. And we had a stop in Tom Ball. So then we changed it to Tomball. So that was a, a natural area to gravitate to, to watch the train go by. People would dress up to watch, the, go to the depot and wave to the train as it went by, because it was not, it was also passenger. Uh, so back then and before it became all freight. So, that was kind of an event area, so that was a natural progression. Um, our the people back then were said, "Well, let's look at getting the land and seeing what we can do." And in the depot, I hopefully that we can bring back some of the train cars and have more historical train cars. We we almost had um, had a museum, but at that time it was voted down. So hopefully that will be back in the future. And then the sister city. Um, said we have the sister city of Telstra, Germany, the city and Telstra, Germany. And so how that started was Kit Pfeiffer. Uh, she, it was exchange students that some of Germans exchange students would come here and then eventually some of ours would go there, but you had to learn German. <laughs> they knew English, a lot knew English. So that started and then the big German fest, the sister city, which was uh, Grady and Sandra Martin, were the people who kind of got that going. So here you have citizens that think of things good for the city and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And it's grown from there. And we've had great, and we still do have great people that have great ideas. Uh, the Tidy Up Tomball has just been kicked off, um, which some of our areas are beginning to have a little more trash and such. And a citizen came in and said, I'd like to start this. They've got it going. Uh, some of the events and a lot of the growth, okay, if we're trying to be a destination place that people come here, let's go to Tombaugh and see what's going on. What do we have to do to make that happen? And so with that type of thinking, that's what happens. Mm good ideas. We've bought the Baptist Church. We'll be uh, seeing what to do with that. It's a three-year feasibility study. I rented it back to see exactly what's a good thing to go there. Uh, we hope to expand the depot more. So there's more uh, land that has been bought across the tracks. So what we're trying to do from, from uh, Willow all the way to Elm, that's our 115-year-old historical area. And that, we can't compete with Montgomery County's land. We don't have enough land for master plan communities. We're in the process of looking at the infrastructure, estimating how much it's going to cost to make sure our water, sewage, and gas lines are enough to accommodate all this growth. I know it's not pretty, but it's not, oh, let them build it. It will come. No, no. You must be able to flush your commode before they come in. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we have, that's why we have turned some developments down and said, no, we can't accommodate you. One, that massive amount of water is what they needed. It would have been good for the town, but we could not accommodate the water. So we say no. We say no. And hopefully our Texas legislature doesn't pass a law that keeps us from saying no. Um, well, I was wondering if there's anything else you'd like to share with us while we're still on camera here? No, I thank you all for doing this. Thank you.
Thank you for coming up with the ideas. You all both have been such great volunteers with this museum and your ideas. And I'm excited to see all the growth and changes that will happen. Yeah. We sure appreciate your time today. Thank yeah. you for coming. Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs>